to the new JFK show number 177. It's our New Year's show. So there has to be some time for some levity after some serious work. So after the show, everyone's invited to go ahead and pop open their champagne bottle and uh, have a sip. There's Larry with a Bud Light. I know Dr. Fetcher's tearing down some uh, ice water at the moment. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm pounding an Ozarka. Yeah. Those are in the guys, guys, I, I don't I don't drink. I just you know I'm just showing this, but I don't drink. All right. So we've got a special treat tonight. After we get serious, it's the JFK beauty pageant. So we're gonna find out who's the most beautiful women in JFK. But, hey, but Gary, you can't put you can't put Marilyn Monroe up against any of these. Uh, 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 don't give it away. I'm gonna edit that out. Don't worry. We will not give it away like that. Okay. <laughs> All right, so now the first thing that we want to get to is Sylvia Duran had a basically something she wrote in her own words that was misfiled in Harold Weisberg's files under Sylvia Odia. Now, yeah. our man Larry Rivera has gone in and located the document and found out that it was misfiled and it was written in Spanish. So he's taking the time because. Larry's first language is Spanish, in case everyone didn't know that. So he's been able to translate Sylvia Duran's, and I'm telling you now, it's almost like watching a movie. As Dr. Fester reads it, you, you'll almost be there. It's that good. So, I think it's stunning. I think it's stunning, Gary. It's, it's a it's stunning unbelievable. Uh, and you can bet your butt they're not doing any kind of hard work like this over there at Black Ops, and I'm just telling you. So, all right. Dr. Fester, you've got a lot of reading to do tonight, and uh, so we might as well get going. Sylvia Duran, in her own words. All serious JFK researchers know about Sylvia Duran, the secretary at the Cuban consulate who had several interactions with a Lee Oswald in late September 1963. Volume 3 of the HSCA contains a belated interview of Duran, Sylvia Tirado. Of course, she never testified before the Warren Commission. From day one, the arrest and mistreatment of Duran was viewed as a very serious matter by the U.S. government. There's a lot of good background information here at the following link, Mary Farrell. This link points to ARRB released documents that truly describe the chaotic circumstances of her arrest. There is, however, one Sylvia Duran document that I found misfiled at Harris Weinberg's site at Hood College. Apparently, those who were processing Harold's files mistook Sylvia Odio for Sylvia Duran and placed this personal account in Odio's directory. Can you yes. click on that? Jim, can you click on that, uh, Odio? Uh, because it's important that we see that, that document uh, real quick. It's completely in Spanish. There you go. El fantasma de Kennedy, John F. Kennedy, me persigue periódicamente. Me aparece cuando pienso que la pesadilla ha terminado. Okay, that's how it starts. Go ahead, you can go back. Yes, the document is in Spanish, so I took to the task of translating it since it appears no one had ever wondered what she was trying to express. It's also possible that Weisberg did not realize the importance of her statement. A word of caution. This is a direct translation. President past tenses are mixed, and she does not differentiate with quotes when one of the principals is speaking to her and vice versa. And this is all intertwined with her own personal thoughts. Also, please note she did not establish paragraphs. It's all in one continuous stream of words and sentences. A very important and incriminating Lee Oswald link to Duran was cited by the Warren Commission, and it pertains to Duran's name written in Lee Oswald's address book which appears in CE 18, volume 16. Do you want me to visit that one too? Sure, sure, sure. There it is. Uh, you see on the right, it says uh, Mexico City, Consulado de Cuba, Zamora y Mar F. Marquez. Right, here, 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 here. Right, right there, right well, we there. we felt that the name had been added yes, to yes, it. Yes, 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 we talked about this last week and we're gonna revisit that, of course. Right, very good. We'll present a study which puts this into proper perspective and allows the reader to decide if the evidence is real. Here is Sylvia's translated statement written 15 years after the fact. John F. Kennedy's ghost chases me. Periodically, it reappears when I think the nightmare is over. Today, May 28, 1978, Horatio called me 
to tell me that judicial agents contacted him and Ruben to tell me that Interpol agents will be passing through Mexico and they wanted to ask me some questions. Could it be that I will be persecuted all my life by a casual encounter? On a day in March 1975, I arrive at my office at the Secretary of Labor. Madam Attorney, they have called twice from New York. I am not an attorney. Do they leave a message? They will call later, Madam Attorney. After a few calls to my house, then my office, Ms. Collins located me. I'm Mr. Epstein's secretary. He's writing a book about Kennedy, and he's interested in talking to you. He has plans to visit Dallas next month and from there on to Mexico, if you will grant him an interview. All we know is contained in the Warren report. I have nothing more to add, she insists. We agree that he would call me from Dallas. Epstein writes for Reader's Digest. Let's, let's I, establish there, there first. A bell. Uh, that's Edward uh, Epstein who wrote who wrote the book on uh, on Leo's Inqu yeah. inquest. Yeah, inquest, of course. <clears throat> I go away on vacation and forget about Epstein. The day I return, I find out they are in Mexico. From the airport, I go straight to my office, and when I arrive home that night, I find that someone slid a letter underneath the door. They fly back the next day. I refuse to see them. That is not what was agreed on. They write, I never reply. Miss Collins calls me on the phone and we decide she will send a questionnaire. I never received it. One night in October 1976, someone calls me to verify my address and tells me that Mr. Kessler will drop by to visit. I don't know who he is. A few days later, a couple of good looking youngsters drop by my house. We are reporters for the Washington Post. Is that the newspaper that published the Watergate case? Yes, I like them. We are investigating the assassination of President Kennedy, and I come from Washington to interview you. Uh, Mar Marlies is our correspondent in Mexico. After 13 years of science, I agree to speak to the press and answer all of their questions. And for the first time, my photo is published in an American newspaper. Why did I do it? I don't know. Perhaps because of the notoriety? Uh, maybe because it's a famous newspaper, or maybe because I am tired of uh, being gagged for so many years, uh, a suggestion by the federal security police. I prefer to infer it was due to female solidarity. Woman reporter Marlies would get the credit for obtaining the first interview, which I ever conceded to the press, and I hope it is the last. Months later, they called me once again from New York this time an investigator from the University of Columbia, Columbia University, who was doing his thesis on Kennedy. He asked a few questions and now a year later Interpol appears. I was under the impression that those type of police only existed in TV episodes. Once again, 1963 came upon me. Cuban consulate in Mexico, Friday, November 22nd, 1963, it's approximately 2 p.m. They have assassinated President Kennedy. Much commotion. The news goes from mouth to mouth. It's my birthday. I've invited a few friends to dinner. I don't know what to do. I cancel dinner. I tell some of them others I cannot locate. At night, we gather at my house. Everyone talks about the same thing. Radio, television, unanimously all media describe the assassination and the arrest of the presumed assassin. They announce his affiliation. Throughout the world, the news is heard at the same time. Lee Harvey Oswald, American, married to a Russian, lived in the USSR. My memory goes back to September 27th. Do you speak English? Yes, I need a transit visa to Cuba. I'm going to the Soviet Union. He shows me his worker's ID card, letters addressed to the North American Communist Party, not soliciting, uh, soliciting information, newspaper cutouts which showed him struggling or being subdued by the arm. By some policeman at a meeting in support of the Cuban Revolution, a fair play for Cuba and New Orleans credential. Have we He's, ever seen, have, Jim? Have we ever seen that uh, photograph? I don't. I don't. I don't. I've never seen anything where uh, uh, Lee Oswald is being subdued and being. No, led. I agree, seen? Larry. I haven't either. Yeah. He says he's a communist. Why did he not visit the Cuban Communist Party? In these types of cases, the Communist Party of his country would contact the Cuban Communist Party and they would directly process his visa. I found it strange that he would be traveling with all of those documents and I deemed him to be naive. I asked him for photographs. He has not. He asked where to have them taken and I give him the address of a place nearby where they have automatic machines. Sometime afterward, one or two hours perhaps, he returns. 
we fill his form. I give him a slip of paper with my name and the telephone number of the consulate. Call me in a week to check on your visa. It's impossible. I can only be in Mexico for three days. My tourist permit expires. There is nothing we can do here first. You must obtain your visa from the Soviet embassy. And Cuba automatically extends a transit visa with the understanding that if a flight is announced to a country to which you are traveling, you will not be able to leave the airport in Havana. I am a friend of Cuba. I want to visit the island and see the achievements of the revolution. I feel pity for him. He does not seem to understand what I am telling him. I explain once again about the requirements to travel to Cuba. His eyes beg for protection and are supported by an ungainly body. He appears yeah. That's strange. He appears not to be sure of himself. I explain how to reach the Soviet embassy that same afternoon. Corinne, a co-worker in charge of the gate, calls me on the interval. Girl, I'm sending an American that speaks no Spanish. We only serve the public in the morning and in the afternoon. The doors of the consulate were closed and no one would enter via the gates of the embassy. One second, one second Jim, there, because uh, Judy, uh, uh, as you all know, I, I've translated Judy's uh, a book. And Judy herself has uh, stated in her book that Lee spoke Spanish not as well as a, you know as a, as a native but he he spoke enough Spanish to get by you know but what Sylvia is is um, describing here is a gringo who doesn't speak any Spanish at all okay so it it cannot be Lee Oswald if that's what right. Judith's description is correct it cannot that's, be Lee that's right okay and how many warehouse workers speak russian spanish and english <laughs> yeah that's a talented guy that was trilingual of that order. That's right. That's right. We only well, certainly, you know, if a guy spoke all those languages and he was a radar operator and he defected to the Soviet Union and came back, you might think he was an intelligence operative. You might. Yes, yeah, the thought might cross your mind. Well, and, yeah. and not only that, she, ta she talks about ungainly. You know, yeah, uh, that's parent. odd. That That's not we either. That's, yeah, and, and later on she's going to say that uh, he's five six. You know, if you uh, if you look at the uh, photograph, we've talked about this before of him being let out of the uh, Texas theater. You know, you can see he's got abs and everything. He is a strong man. He is in shape. Okay, so you know it's like night and day. You know, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. To pick back up that same afternoon, Joran, a co-worker in charge of the gate, calls me on the interphone. Girl. I'm sending an American that speaks no Spanish. We only serve the public in the morning and in the afternoon. The doors to the consulate were closed and no one would enter via the gates of the embassy. It was Oswald visibly excited. In other words, someone she knew by the name Oswald. I went to the Soviet embassy and they will give me the visa. He insists on obtaining his Cuban visa as soon as possible. I again explained the conditions. He does not want to accept them. The dialogue is hazy. I only remember his insistence. To get rid of him, I call the Cuban uh, consul. Yes, that man did request a visa, and the response will take three to four months. Why not come to Mexico and go through Cuba, where he can travel from the U.S.? It is faster and cheaper. He did not want to hear this. His face turned red, his small eyes gleam, and his feeble figure he is no taller than five foot. Five, six, eight. Five, five foot, six, eight. Well, but six, eight, Larry. You mean five no, foot, no, six? No, no, no. Five, six. It's five, six, almost five, seven. You know, because I, I, uh, I uh, it's converted with the meter. She says 1.7 meters, and 1.7 meters is five, uh, five feet, point six, eight. Oh, five. Well, this should be 5.68 feet with a single, not the double. Yeah. It looks like yeah. feet and inches. Yeah. Right. right. Okay. <clears throat> Appears to grain strength. It's not possible. I cannot wait that long, he yells. I try to convince him there's nothing that can be done except wait. I am unable to calm him. Eusebio, uh, as, uh, as Q, the outgoing council happens to be in the next office briefing Mirabel, the new council, about pending matters. Eusebio, there's a guy here who's very angry because he's been refused a visa. Would you talk to him? The council calmly explains once more the requirements that need to be met. We cannot do anything. We receive instructions from Cuba. He does not understand the reasons and continues to gesticulate. 
Ice Q loses his patience. If you were a real revolutionary, you would understand the reasons why visas cannot be granted to just anyone who solicits them. So please leave this consulate immediately unless you want me to kick you out. Oswald is in near tears. He babbles unintelligible words and leaves. As I prepare some snacks at home that evening, I re relive the episode. Horatio, I'm sure that Kennedy's assassin is a gringo who solicited a visa to Cuba. There are not many Americans married to Russian women. I have been a secretary at the Cuban consulate for three months. Mer Mara Carmen, a dear friend, died in an automobile accident, and I offered to fill her position until Cuba arranges for a person to take her place. Saturday, November 23rd, the morning newspaper arrives. There is his face now in black and white. I have no doubt. So, Larry, we no. lost him. No, I'm here. I'm here. So she says, I have. So this was Lee Oswald, even though she's describing him in this odd way? Well, my hypothesis is, is that it is a lookalike who is, uh, looks so much like him. Okay, that uh, she might have not been able to distinguish him. There were later on uh, some theories about uh, the Seymour guy uh, uh, being possibly, you know, uh, impersonating Oswald in Mexico City. Okay, but uh, that, that's one of the conundrums in this whole thing, you know, that she, you know, the man that she sees, you know, on television is the man that, that she uh, interviewed and interacted with, however. Appears to her to be the same man that she had right, interviewed. Appears, right, right, <laughs> but, but her description of him, and there's another description of him that she said that he was blonde. Okay. Yeah, it's completely inconsistent with the real guy, including, the, the, of course, the inability to speak Spanish. Right, 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 right. There is his face now in black and white, I have no doubts. I arrive at the consulate, search the file. I find the form with the authorization from the Minister of Foreign Relations of, Cu of Cuba in case the Soviet Union authorizes his entry. Excited, I cross the garden. I go to the ambassador's office. Look here, I show him the file. No explanation are necessary. I have read the newspapers and Lee Harvey Oswald has become familiar. I am off work. My sister-in-law and a friend wait for me at my house to eat as we do every Saturday. We just moved in. We have no telephone. We're sitting at a table when all of a sudden someone knocks loudly on the door. Rita enters my brother-in-law's maid. She sees me and explodes in tears. Senora, are you all right? Some men came to the house. They took Mr. Rubin so he could identify you. They told him that you had an accident. And Senora Betty asked me to stop by and find out what happened. We all look at each other. Horatio says, this is very strange. Let's all go in separate cars. We did as such. I arrived to find a house full of men. Betty, my brother's brother-in-law's wife, screams when she sees me. Sylvia, you're alive. Next to her, a tall, strong-looking man dressed in a suit does not allow her to approach me. I turn toward the room. I see Reuben with photos in his hand. Sylvia, Sylvita, what happened? Someone yells. Sylvia Duran is here. I extend my hand toward the telephone. Someone grabs it. You cannot talk on the phone. You are under arrest. I sit on the bed. I'm not moving from here unless you show me a warrant signed by a judge. Two agents jump me and throw me onto the bed. Each one grabs an arm. I kick and hit two others who approach. The four remove me from the room. I begin to scream. Their hands are like vices that seem to break my arms and legs. They gag me. Shut up, you no no noisy hag. This is nothing compared to what await you. awaits you. They drag me out of the apartment. The half block seems like an eternity. I can hardly breathe. When they cover my mouth, they also cover my nose. They throw me into a van next to a blonde man I do not know. He has the look of a gringo. In front, they seat a woman who is also blonde. She's a friend of Betty's I've seen once or twice. She was visiting, and Chuck, the American sitting next to me, was picking her up for dinner. Now we're at the building, which houses the Institute for Safety and Social Services for Workers of the State, in front of the Revolution Monument. They take me to an office. I'm able to see how they take Horatio, Reuben, Betty, Lynn, and Agatha somewhere else. This is unconstitutional. Have you not realized that we don't give a damn about Juarez and the Constitution? Why won't you tell me why I am here? They leave me alone in a sort of filing room. My mouth hurts. It's swollen. I rub my arms. They also hurt. My sleeve is ripped. They take me somewhere else. 
A man in front of a typewriter asks, date and place of birth, education, employment history. They take photographs, front, profile. They fingerprint all fingers of both hands. I think they failed to measure and weigh me, or do they ask in a small room before a table with a microphone at the center? They begin to interrogate me, five agents. At one point, I counted eight. They all ask at the same time. One in shirt sleeve with bulldog face raises his foot on the chair. He blows smoke in my face. Where were you born? In Mexico, DF. When you address me, call me sir, he yells. Did you address me as senora when you uh, address me? Where were you born? In Mexico, in the DF, federal district. Are you a communist? No. He walks to gesticulate. Look, senora, don't deceive us. More than talking, he barked. Lenin says you're a communist when you're a member of the Communist Party. I am not affiliated with the Communist Party, so I'm not a communist. But do you believe that the best system is that of communist countries? There is no communist country, only socialist. He draws a deep breath and his eyes want to kill me. I arrived at Marxism via Sark. <coughs> he says that existentialism is valid when it coincides with Marxism. Where did you learn this? At the School of Philosophy, we took introduction to Marxism. We also studied the pre-Socratics and, and positive logic. Are you, you, probably that means logical positivism. Yeah, yeah, time, yeah, time out, Jim. You can tell us about that more than anybody because you're the expert, you know. Uh, you know, what, what, what do you uh, think she's trying to convey here? Well, uh, yeah, Sartre was an uh, existentialist and he would have, uh, uh, offered a view like, uh, you know, the blend of existentialism with Marxism. I think that's reasonable. She studied the pre-Socratics. Of course, that's ancient philosophy. Uh, uh, positive logic. I'm just wondering. She, she could be talking about symbolic logic. Well, or, remember, or she could be talking about logical positivism, which is an analytical movement of the 20th century uh, that sought to draw a clear distinction between metaphysical or untestable hypotheses and those that are capable of scientific evaluation where only the latter were regarded as meaningful. So there's an ambiguity here. So what about somebody that is uh, very uh, um, uh, aware of this type of philosophy, you know, uh, you think this would be normal, you know, for a woman that's working as a, as a receptionist, secretary? No, this is, that would be fairly unusual. Right, right, right evincing a certain intellectual sophistication. I, it's what I'm saying. That's that I would not suppose was possessed by her co-workers. <laughs> and remember, Marx was Jewish and communism is Jewish. <laughs> Are you a member of the Spartan League? No. Did you know Jose Revoluzas, its leader, Pepe? Of course, he's a magnificent writer. Have you read The Headless Proletariat? Of course. What is your take on Revolutas? He is Hegelian. What, ask the man who registers everything I say into a sort of typewriter, how many times have you visited Cuba? Who did you see? What places did you visit? What instructions were you given? I'm thirsty. After five hours of interrogation, that light seems as bright as the sun. I want to smoke. I feel a burning sensation in my eyes and throat. Did you have sexual relations with Oswald? A, ra a thin Nazi type man enters the room, the boss. Captain Gutierrez Barrios, you could only have had three types of contact with Oswald. Job-related as man and woman or political, they all hushed when he spoke. The captain was the only one who asked concrete questions without yelling. In a cruel and educated way, I needed to go to the ladies' room. Two agents accompany me. One on front, the other behind with a pistol in hand, cartridge engaged. They do this to protect me. They fear someone might take a shot at me. I come back. In one moment, I cry, scream, I become desperate. I get up and walk around the small room. An agent jumps on me, literally tackling me. Careful, they can shoot you through the window. If they're capable of killing your president, a witness doesn't stand a chance. Oswald frequented the Mexican Cuban Institute, and that is where you met him. Thirst continues to increase, and I start losing my voice. Don't play the weak one. You're a strong woman. You have already shown it. They show me a photograph of Oswald. Your husband drew this and says you introduced him at the Institute. Seven hours is too much time to prove my innocence. Really, probably too little time. Before a group of policemen who continuously take turns treating me as guilty. Of what? A cigarette? 
for nothing in the world would I accept a cigarette from them. I hate them. They also hate me. What do you want to know? Is there a tunnel that connects the Russian and Cuban embassies? How long did you work at the Cuban Institute? Who are your collaborators or names, addresses? This is where they have their programs. I used to send them asking for police protection. I know of one. How many times did you attend the Institute? Do you remember the tear gas bombs? I myself used to call them when we would program an activity. All of them cultural. Why am I repeating what you already know? I don't know the addresses. All are names that I know. Carlos Pellicer is the honorary director. Carlos Fuentes and Carlos Monsvillaza are in charge of the literary section. I coordinated the activities. I don't know how many times I repeated what I spoke to Oswald about. The captain enters and gives me a sheet of paper and says, repeat what you wrote for Oswald. I write my name and the consulate's phone number exactly the same way I did for all who solicited visas. So they will not go to the consulate in exactly the same as I did with Oswald. I did not overreach my responsibilities as affirmed in the Warren Commission. I fulfilled the routine. The captain leaves, comes back, and asks the same. I don't know how many times this operation is repeated. Finally, he says that Oswald had my name and phone number in his agenda, meaning in his... That's and that's what we discussed last week, remember? And um, right, that it appeared to be added in exactly. Exactly, uh, they're all presuming that she actually had contact with Lee Harvey Oswald when it's rather apparent that she did not. That well, it was someone well, who is pretending right. to be Lee Harvey Oswald, right? But more, more than what uh, was really called for in her execution of her duties which she obviously, okay. Okay, look, this was just a routine op, uh, thing, you know, that I did like maybe 10 or 20 times a day. You know, I helped him fill out forms. I, I oriented him, you know, on where to go and what to do. And, uh, you know, and this is like she said, you know, I did this all the time. So why, you know, why am I being uh, harassed? You know, what do y'all make of these people tackling her, throwing her in a room? All these men. Uh, That's rather brutal. I think she's a rather petite woman. Why would they be brutalizing her this yeah. way? And, and, and this was and this was the Mexican. This was the Mexican police. This was the Mexican police who did this because the orders from Washington were to let the Mexican police do this because they did not want any uh, interference. You know of uh, American uh, uh, agencies. You know, namely the FBI and the CIA. And they wanted uh, Mexico, the Mexico, to take care of this, okay, and not uh, sort of like uh, leave the trail, you know, stop the trail, you know, uh, there, and uh, let Mexico just, you know, uh, dance to the tune of, of Washington. That's that's the way I interpret this. I think he had the slip of paper that I'd given him with my information, and they were verifying the writing style. After eight hours of interrogation, everything is cleared up. I am not to blame. Sorry about the inconveniences. We suggest you not make any comments about this with anyone. It was our duty to do an inv exhaustive investigation to show that Mexico had nothing to do with the assassination of President Kennedy. The FBI had asked permission to send you to the U.S. for interrogation. With your statement, it has been demonstrated that Oswald had no links to Mexican left-wing groups. We could not allow the American authorities to interrogate you. Mexican citizens are protected by Mexican laws. Go home in peace with your family and don't talk to anyone about this. Good night and thank you for your cooperation. Sign your statement and go. One last act of defiance. First, I want you to read it. It's one in the morning. If I can't read it, I won't sign it. We all leave to get something to eat. Everyone is excited and each recounts their own experience. Horatio was slapped in the face and they dislocated his jaw because he did not answer two agents who questioned him at the same time. They asked him to draw a picture of Oswald, the same one they showed me. The only time he saw it was when I showed him the newspaper that same morning. Okay, I just want to make a, a parenthesis here. Uh, let's, let's not forget that the United States, under uh, President Polk, took over more than half of the territory of Mexico as a result of the Mexican-American War of, uh, of the 1930s, 1940s, okay? After that, Came the revolution in Mexico in the 1920s, okay, where, you know, the the uh, uh, the dictatorship was uh, uh, was abolished. You know, there was a dictatorship of almost 40 years. So Mexico is sort of like a parallel with Cuba. So 
when uh, the Cuban Revolution happens, uh, Mexico identifies, okay, with uh, the Cuban Revolution. And especially Mexico, you think Mexico having, having had that, those experiences with the United States, where the United States uh, invaded, actually, they made it all the way to Mexico City, okay, through Veracruz, the Puerto Veracruz, you know, they marched all the way, uh, you know, and, and, and since Mexico had no naval uh, capabilities, they were at a complete disadvantage where the U.S., you know, completely invaded Mexico. They did, uh, they, uh, Mexico had to uh, uh, go by the terms of, of the, uh, of, of at that time, you know, with uh, the United States and, and where at the end, the United States ended up, ended up paying Mexico for uh, land that was from Oregon all the way through Texas, okay? Like I said, they, they lost half of their territory as a result of the Mexican-American War. And so you think that Mexico is gonna, you know, bend over backwards for the United States or anything that they wanna do uh, in, in Mexico or, or witnesses, Mexican witnesses or things like that? You know, so that, you need to uh, put that into the proper perspective. And uh, actually I would, I would uh, you know, talk to, I would like to talk to Mexican historians, you know, and-, and um, Yeah, by yeah, the way, I think the, Positive logic probably meant formal logic. I don't believe it meant logical positivism. I think it meant formal logic or yeah. formalizing sentences to construct proofs. Yeah, she's just. Uh, in a, <clears throat> she's now, now, here's a course where we went through the fact that the the words Sylvia Duran are not in the same letters and styles as the other printing in Lee Oswald, so that it was added. It was and not by yeah. Lee. And, and don't forget, and no, don't forget that she she said herself that she just put it on a piece of paper. Right. Okay? He did not write it in his address book. Right. Okay? Right. No, this was an attempt. This, this was an attempt to conduct con, concoct a story that Lee Oswald, the, the alleged assassin, was going to make his escape through Cuba to the Soviet Union, which mm -hmm. shows he did it because he was a communist and he hated Kennedy and whatever. Just a absolute cartoon version of the assassination which they pathetic. sold to the american people that's right pathetic i would say pathetic. pathetic no serious person would accept it but americans are so gullible and uncritical and willing to buy what the government told them especially at this period of time well don't let's not forget how the hearst uh, empire uh completely uh flipped the uh, the spanish-american war right right okay right, right. <laughs> Absolutely. So we know. All right. There's more. We arrived home. The maid was waiting for us, frightened. She told us that as soon as we left, some men came and searched the entire house, even under the mattresses. What? They took some books, photographs, and letters. The kids were very frightened. Paul, 10 years old, the son of Horatio, after the agents left, followed them and noted they boarded a vehicle without any pl plates. Since we lived a few blocks from the Cuban embassy, he went and announced we had disappeared and the house had been searched. I don't think we slept that night. Sunday was sad and gray. We did not want to answer the phone or open the door. At night, a friend came to visit and comment on the assassination. He'd been invited to be with us Friday night for my birthday. We hardly talked. We were terrorized and thought there were microphones throughout the house. Of course, we told him nothing about the arrest. The following day, Monday the 25th, I showed up at, to work and was surprised to see that everyone at the embassy was asking about the interrogation. How did they find out when I wasn't supposed to say anything? It's on the front pages of this morning's Excelsior. Indeed, they reported what I said about Oswald's visit to the consulate and how Accus had chased him away. I met with the ambassador and told him in detail what happened Saturday the moment I left the consulate. I showed him the bruises. I had on my arms and legs. I tried to recount the interrogation step by step. A report was sent to Cuba. It was Monday, airmail day. That same day, Fidel spoke with Askew, who was already in Havana working for the revolutionary government. Usubio corroborated what I had said and also remembered what transpired. Fidel expressed doubts about me since I had been threatened. We're on the third floor. We say that in a moment of hysteria, you jumped out of the window. Don't forget you have a three-year-old daughter. I really thought I was going to die, and I decided it was best that my daughter know that her mother had died telling the truth and not have a mother who had betrayed herself in a moment of weakness. Can there be anything, any any person more honorable than that? 
Jim, you know, and then yeah. she's being That's very impressive, right. What they're trying to make us believe is that something that she does every day, the same way to every person who comes in, all of a sudden Lee walks in and they she throws him in a closet and makes mad passionate love to him. Yeah, That's the so claim. How, how absurd how absurd is that? Yeah, that she's a lush, a sex pot, you know, a promiscuous. Yeah. You know. She's gonna throw him in the closet and let's go, Lee. You're not hot. It's just crazy. The whole story is not. Yeah, we spoke about this, you know, last week. You know how you know how could you expect uh, or, or think that a woman, you know, of uh, the is the with the virtuous. Uh, uh, and she's married with a child. Yeah, yeah, that she would be. That she's know, Catholic and she. <laughs> no, no, and, they, and that she would just, you know, any 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 person that shows up to consulate, you know, she's gonna go and go to bed with them, you know. Okay. It's just ridiculous. Work. It's just no, ridiculous. No. He's at work. And and not only that, imagine, see when I say it's like a movie, imagine your name's on the front page, like in the CSI episode. You're on, um, you know, like I said, in newspaper. I, I, think this is, I, think, yeah, I think this is a stunning, a stunning uh, account of what he went through, you know, in those days, you know, right after the assassination. Well, this, yeah, this so let's get going. Well, they were trying to manufacture a link with Mexico City, the Cuban embassy, yeah. and Russia. I mean, this was and, an and, attempt to and manufacture, and she was the key player mm -hmm. because she had had the contact with the person they, who was impersonating Lee. And don't forget that communism, you know, em envelopes this whole scenario here, Jim. Yes. Yeah. Continuing. Subio knew me and I and told him uh, uh, I would never betray the Cuban revolution, that I was a red-boned revolutionary, and that no threats would make me say things that were not true. That same night, Fidel, along with Raul Roa, Minister of Foreign Affairs, wrote up a letter where they protested the way in which an employee of their consulate in Mexico had been treated. The letter of protest was delivered to the Mexican ambassador in Cuba. I hereby reproduce it exactly as it was published by the newspaper Hoy in Havana on Wednesday the 27th. That morning I was on my way to breakfast when two agents arrived. I already knew them. They questioned me on Saturday and they kindly asked me to accompany them for some clarifications, not to bother driving my car. They would bring me back in a couple of hours. I spoke to the consulate advising I would come in a little late. Everything was done in the world's most natural way. Those two hours turned into 60, approximately. They took me to the same room in an agent with green eyes, the most aggressive of all, the same one who had affirmed that Oswald was my lover and that he was going to tell my husband, said to me, point blank, I have a black and blue bruise caused by a very well-placed blow by you, and no government has protested on my behalf. It was one of those blows when they subdued me at Ruben's house, one of the kicks. Uh, I threw, hit, hit him in the testicles. I, I, I felt as my flun, foot plunged into a soft mass and yeah. saw how he doubled over in pain. And now his eyes flashed in anger, which transmitted to the hands that grabbed my leg with a force that immobilized me completely. Does that, I, mean, that, she, does that mean that she kicked him in the nuts? Yes. <laughs> she kicked him in the balls. That's right. <laughs> I mean, she, she, she was a good woman, and she was yeah. defending herself. Yeah. Glad you cleared that up. <laughs> I will never forget his face. At that moment, I did not understand what he said. The Cuban protest was not known at the time. By noon, the newspapers had published the famous note that called protests from both right and left. Fidel Velazquez, labor leader with more than 40 years at the helm, every country has its well-deserved Fidel, declared that Cuba had no right to interfere in the internal affairs of Mexico. The Mexican Communist Party uh, the violent way a Mexican uh, must have been protested, the violent way a Mexican citizen had been treated. Ruben Salazar, male and journalist, said, I was a prostitute at the service of international communism. In a survey taken by the News, an English section of Novedadas among the housewives, they demanded that my Mexican nationality be revoked. <laughs> For an entire week, I was front page news in the country's newspapers. I mean, this is outrageous. We're all uh, prostitutes for international communism. Outrageous. <laughs> isn't, this, uh, isn't this amazing? Isn't this amazing? Yeah. Uh, unaware of the course that events had taken, I did not understand the reasons for the second event, notwithstanding the attitude of the agents. This time they were very cordial, too courteous, especially the one with the green eyes. They asked me about my trip to Cuba. 
I assume this subject had already been exhausted during the previous interrogation, how wrong I was. The same questions, only more detailed. Each word I said gave way to another question. This time the interrogation was much longer and inquisitive from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. I was dying of thirst and uh, hunger. You want some tortillas? I would rather die than accept anything from them. Around 6 p.m., Horatio showed up. Gordita, don't worry. He shows me the newspapers. They are protecting you. You will stay here until the danger is past. I brought you some blankets. Ruben sends a TV. Have you eaten? I cannot open up to him. They won't leave me alone with him. The two and a half days I spent there, I was never alone for a second. Captain Barritos tried to be friendly. Fidel Castro spent some time in this room. On one occasion, we protected him when Batista agents came to kill him. Ask for anything you need. They bring the menu from Sanborn's Law Fragua so that I can choose what I want. I feel calmer and devour the first meal of the day already at nightfall. I don't remember clearly what happened during those days. One of the things that bothered me most was the presence of the agent with green eyes who acted in an aggressive manner and immediately was recriminated by his partners. In the morning, they would bring all the newspapers. I watched TV and chose the food. I was a prisoner in luxury. On Friday afternoon, they take me to the captain's office. Senora, the danger has passed. You can go home. After all the security measures they took to protect me, now they throw me out into the street. I cannot go by myself. Let an agent take me home. The captain was eager to get rid of me. He seemed nervous and continuously looked out the window. Impossible. No one can take you home. Allow me to talk to Horatio. I was not going to stand at a corner, wait for a taxi with all my things, clothes, blankets, TV. Horatio was not home. I called my sister-in-law. We're close to the Revolution Monument. Please come for me. I quickly gathered my things, and I feel how everything changes at a moment's notice. I cannot. An entire week being brainwashed, showing me that I was a key person in the Kennedy assassination. Thanks to you, it was known that it was not a communist plot hatched in Mexico. They can kill her. I could not push a button and suddenly feel that the danger had effectively passed. They did a good job on me. After 60 hours being locked up, I came out, and the first thing I see, Sylvia Duran has no diplomatic immunity. When did I have it, and when would I have it? Manuel Tello, Secretary of Foreign Affairs, is interviewed upon his arrival at the airport after yeah, having I think, attended. I think you jumped, uh, it says the news he yells out the news. Uh, yeah, you jumped that right there. Right after immunity. Oh, the newsie. Yes, right. the newsie. That means the newspaper seller. Yeah. yeah. The newsie yells out the news as I extend my arm to buy the newspaper. I have no diplomatic immunity. When did I have it and why would I have it? Manuel Tello, Secretary of Foreign Affairs, is interviewed upon his arrival at the airport after having attended Kennedy's funeral. And as a person who announces the above statement, I do not understand, however, hearing my name everywhere begins to terrify me, and I end up sitting on the floor of my car. Lynn is also nervous and decides to take me to her house. I enjoy a delicious bath. My eyes scan the quiet street free of screaming newsies. I realize I am in front of a window. I duck. They can see me and someone can shoot. The policemen have done a perfect brainwash. They would have congratulated me over my reactions of fear. Lynn has no telephone, and they decide to take me to my brother-in-law's house. I am an object that is transported from one place to another. Others decide for me. Sylvia Duran does not have the Congress of the Union's permission to work at the Cuban Embassy. Now the announcement comes from Gustavo Diaz Ordaz, Secretary of the Government, and of, which appears on the front page of all evening newspapers of Saturday the 30th. Furthermore, it says that I was invited to testify and mentioned Ruben's address where I was detained. That morning, several stateside newspapers and magazine reporters show up, the News, U.S. World Report, and others. They want to interview me. They leave their cards. Phone calls and visits from Mexican reporters make it impossible for me to stay at my brother-in-law's house. We decide I should go to a friend's house. That's that, it. Wow. 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 That's <laughs> never, it. never, never revealed before, only on this show, the new JFK show, Jim, you know, that's why we're at the vanguard of JFK research. I just have to say that, you know? Yeah. I mean, Larry, I just have to give it to you. That was like you were there. It was just like you were there. Well, well it's in her own words, Gary. It's in her own words. You know how? You know how? You know, 
th this is something that, uh, you know, it's so eloquent, you know, the way that she describes everything, even though she, uh, like I said before, um, the way that she uh, expresses herself in the statement is, is a little bit, you know, hard to, to, to follow. But, you know, uh, I think uh, this is an incredible account of what happened to her. And, uh, you know, like I said, they wanted to make her into a prostitute, you know, a lush, you know, a sex pot, you know. And uh, it just seems to me that uh, that's, there's nothing further from, from the truth. She was well, you know, you know, a it, strong, strong principled woman who certainly knew that there were attempts going on to manipulate her and she wasn't going to oh, play yeah, along. And, and also a very educated woman. Yes. 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 I mean, who talks about Sartre and who talks about, you know, philosophy sure. the way that she does there, you know? Right, and, and right. Don, 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 go ahead. Well, she was a, a prostitute for international communism, as we all are. <laughs> how, how illuminating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. She's no worse than the rest of us as far as that goes. And so, Larry, tell us how you got that again. That was Harold Weisberg's files, and it was a misfiled file. Yeah. Sylvia Odia. That's right. right. That's right. Gary, That's okay, right. we must be on the second half hour, are we not? We're well yeah. past the half hour. Yeah, we're almost yeah, we We're going to go ahead and bypass the commercial. We're just going to keep on rolling. Okay, so, that's good. That's good. That's good. So do you, do you want now to use screen share? Do you want to put up the images? For the second part where we relax, this is fascinating stuff, Larry. I'm so glad you came up with this. Oh, yeah. This is, this is you know, I, I knew right away when I first uh, got a hold of this, uh, it, it, I needed to translate it. It took a little while, you know, and, and once I sort of, I got really into it, it was like, <laughs> you know, I was yeah. just blown away. I was, I, was, I was blown away. Now, now I just, I just want to quickly mention, uh, we're talking about the leering thing, you know. The Learning Project was a, a CIA operation where they- Take it off share screen, Gary, temporarily. Take it off share screen while Larry's talking. The, the Learning, L-I-R-I-N-G, the Learning Project operation was an operation run by the CIA out of Mexico City where they would recruit Mexican nationals to go and infiltrate Cuba and re not only Cuba, but everything that was going on in Central America, Guatemala, you know, in fact, this Leering, uh, Leering Dash 3, uh, his name, his real name was Carlos Jurado del Mar. And this guy was an artist. He was a plastic artist, you know, a painter. And he was completely broke when he met uh, his CIA handler, one Wallace Rowland. Uh, Rowan. And uh, they, they had a relationship, a, a, an intelligence relationship, going all the way from 1961, I believe, through 1969. And uh, I have the document here. Well, my, my okay, my computer is, is done uh, doing the, the uh, update. But uh, I'm going to show you guys later on uh, uh, some incredible, incredible documents. And now uh, with the new releases, we've been, we, uh, we have uh, gathered about, uh, I believe, and documents that that show extensive extensive information about this Leering three Carlos Jurado del Mar. He's the only person who 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 said that uh, 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 Silvia Duran had had sex with Lee Oswald. And and this report doesn't come out until 1967. What I mean, four years after the assassination. What 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 was supposed to be the point? of Sylvia having sex with Lee anyway. I mean, what was that supposed to prove? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. You know, yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. I, agree. I mean, Judith, Judith actually cited that at the conference as proof that Lee had gone to Mexico. He showed her photographs and said, you know, that she was a beautiful woman as though Lee having sex with her was a, a positive thing. Right. But if you, if, uh, you know, next, maybe next week we'll look at some of these uh, documents that I have uncovered uh, because this, this Carlos Jurado was, let me, let me say very bluntly, a scumbag. Okay. And he, and, and he's the one that we're supposed to believe, you know, because he had a phone conversation with Sylvia and he, Sylvia told him, you know, would a woman 
a Mexican woman tell you know a, a, a casual friend you know I you know I was scoring so and so and so you know I, I just don't believe I, I just I don't think that's credible at all and and it, when when you look at uh, this uh, Leering Three's uh, background and what what the, his relationship with the CIA over eight years okay then you start to really understand and you know this whole the, the dynamic here uh, of the you know why he would they would you know place this on him you know four years after the fact okay and, mm -hmm. and it's highly highly yeah it's it, to me it's not credible okay uh, i would i would i would like to see if, if oswald and sylvia duran had sex i would need to see more credible evidence of that and we just don't have it okay. but i think the whole idea was supposed to submit that this was actually lee harvey oswald because if she supposed she had had sex with a man who was there, that was not Lee Harvey Oswald. That was someone else impersonating him. That's right. And 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 I'm go further. If you read the uh, Sylvia Duran's HSCA uh, interview, uh, you know uh, those people uh, asked her, you know, had she had any uh, further involvements with Lee, and she said no. Okay, and uh, you know, and this was the HSCA who sent her. Washington for an interview, and and you can read this in volume three. Well, and this is, a, I think, I, a, I'm convinced the HSCA was trying to redo the cover up and do it better, like contracting the wound, the massive blowout at the back of the head to a tiny hole at the top, which isn't even consistent with a Harper fragment. How outrageous is that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, and again, Ed Lopez, if I have to cite the Lopez report, you know, again and again, you know, where. You know, he found no evidence of Lee being in Mexico City. So, you know. There you go. Well, the, and, the, and this further confirms it because the woman she was interacting with was not Lee Harvey Oswald. Yeah, I don't think so. I, it was somebody who was impersonating him. The description is completely wrong. The face must have looked a lot, but it sounded like he was shorter. And, of course, the fact that he didn't speak Spanish when Lee spoke Spanish. But this was a shorter and a person who was less, he was probably nervous about impersonating Lee, actually. Yeah, 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 absolutely. But he looked enough like him that when Sylvia saw the photograph in the newspaper, she thought it was the same man she'd seen. Yeah, yeah, which is amazing. It's just amazing, amazing, because uh, her description, you know, first there's a description that he was blonde, you know, and uh, that he was 5'6", that he was belligerent, uh, that incident with Asque. I think it speaks volumes because he was crying, he was shouting, you know. They, Lee they, Oswald was just the opposite. He was a very calm, cool. Exactly. Look, at, look how he was under arrest in the Dallas Police Department thank for you. crying out loud. Thank you. Thank you. It's not, it's, it's not the profile of Lee Oswald. Right. No, no, no. And, and not only that, Asquith had to kick him out of the, out of the consulate, okay, out of the embassy. Right. Literally yeah. kick him out. Right. And he said, yeah. I'm going to get... Security, I'm gonna get security on you, and we're gonna get you out of here. And you know, okay, that's not Lee Oswald. Period. Gary's got a special treat for us on New Year's. He's opening his champagne. This is a JFK beauty contest. Lay it on us, Larry. Lay it on us, Gary. Lay it on us. Sometimes you just have to have a little levity here. Yeah, you won't get this on Black Op Radio. That's exactly right. I'm taking my sip right now. <laughs> all right. Happy all right. New Year to everyone. We're ringing our bell, and we're gonna get going. All right. Isn't, isn't that really Black Ops Radio? Is it, it? I have no words anymore. They've just fallen so low. It's almost sad. We almost, you know, it's just very, 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 very. I, mean, I could do an hour almost every week just breaking down all the bullshit Jim DiEugenio is shoveling over. Yeah. Yeah, he, he's got... for 18 years, 18 years, and nothing is new. Nothing, nothing is new. And especially the JFK beauty contest, they will never cover this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, so here what we have. We have three separate categories. First, we have the ugliest women in JFK. We have two nominees. And then we have basically... Um, the not quite respectable ladies of JFK, and then we have the respectable ladies of JFK. So we're going to go through each one starting right now. Now, so the first is the ugliest lady in JFK, period. 
Yeah. Lady Bird Johnson. <laughs> Hands down the winner. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. Ding, 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 ding. Get my vote. <laughs> it's All unanimous. Right. It's unanimous. Okay. Now, well, there was competition. We had a formidable woman behind her. Barbara <laughs> Bush. <laughs> Woo! Well, pretty, pretty hard. You're going to get in trouble for this, Gary. Uh, look, I'm, I'm going to have one more sip, so I, I have an excuse. <laughs> Happy New Year poppy. to everyone. All That's right, so poppy. now we're going to go on to That's the... That's Poppy. Uh, That's Poppy right there. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, he was in Dealey Plaza. We all know that. Yeah, no, you know, he's he's in, in uh, George DeMornschild's uh, address book. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> surprise, yeah. surprise. Barry and the boys and all that. Okay, on to the naughty girls of Dallas. Yeah, so I, I just love that at the bottom it says, in beautiful flesh color. <laughs> love it, yes. <laughs> yeah. Girl, Amateur girl. night for young Get exotics. It. I love that. Burlesque mm -hmm. college. Yeah. Happens after what happens after dark in the big D. Yeah. yeah. The Carousel Club. Yeah. Yeah. Come wow. see them all. And we, brought to you by Jack Ruby. You're right. That's right. That's right. Says, come see them all, and I do, and we do mean all. Woo. Hey, and let's not forget that uh, Roscoe White's uh, wife. You know, work for right Jack. Absolutely. So, okay, so let's see what happens after dark in the big D. All right. There's a... Ooh. With the but, uh, with <laughs> the pasty. But uh call her Ho One. How about that? Where'd you get this one, Gary? I've never seen this one before with the pasties. Wow. Larry, you know, when it's time to do hardcore research in JFK... Hardcore <laughs> research! Just, yeah. leave it, just leave it to no, me, Larry. No pun intended. <laughs> there you go. So, all yeah, right. Got, don't whatever. forget about Jack Ruby. Let, Ruby let's see more of these. Let's see more of these. Hey, that's say, her with more clothes on to the left. And um, Don't forget now, Jack Rubenstein was the guy that the Israeli reporters had as a translator. Yeah. 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 On the right. Friday night yeah. press conference. Yeah. Right. That one on the right looks like a man. Uh, you know what? These days with uh, Michelle Obama, you never know what's going on. <laughs> no, honestly, that one on the right. Look at her shoulders for crying out loud. She's pretty tall, yeah. I'm with you. I'm with you. You know, tw ten years ago, I wouldn't know what you're talking about, but it's a new day we're going living in. So, I, the one in the middle, she's kind of pretty. What do you think? Not too bad. The one to the left, she looks a little rough. Do you uh, have identifications here? No, we have to call him whole one. Ho two and Ruby Ho three. All right. <laughs> so, all right. Yeah. Now here's one more. The only one you can basically see is the bottom left. She's kind of okay. Let's not forget it's a beauty contest, fellas. Well, these are two better looking girls than the other three. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> they look like some of the ones that uh, lived uh, over at that boarding house where Judy uh, first landed when she first yeah. got. To <laughs> Was this woman got a black eye? I, no, this is. All right, this That's is Jada. Jada. Now, Jada is getting some votes from me. I tell you that right now. Jada comfort him. Yeah, this is the one that worked at the club. Jada. Man. Are those all three Jada? Yeah. Yeah, all three Jada. She's my kind of girl, man. All right. She's a fun loving girl, Gary. Yes, sir. <laughs> but, woo, and everything else. And uh, wow. how about that television set? <laughs> yeah, that's impressive. There's a television set there? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Big, beautiful, no, body beautiful Jada. There you go. All right, now this is Blaze Star. Ooh. And uh, what we have here is a letter from Blaze Star to JFK, and they had a little um, fling, let's say. So I got to say, man. Are Blaise, you kidding me? JFK and the, this woman had a fling? Yeah, man, he didn't fool around. When did that happen? Yeah. Well, we'll have to read the letter, but can you read it, Dr. Fesser? <laughs> oh, it's going we'll to be hard. This is going to be hard. Yeah. Now, that's to okay. my dear friend, just a... Fine to answer your letter. Oh, yes. There was a lot of things I didn't tell in my... 
Uh, Jackie something Kennedy. in the common place. Jackie Kennedy was my idol. After uh, Governor Earl Long passed That's away, I... Friendship with uh, then President JFK. I had uh, known him since 1952. He was regular on weekends. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> uh, at a club we worked in D.C., CBS oh. newsman Paul Niven was a good friend of JFK. He would pick me up at my home. Oh. In Maryland? In Maryland, about 20 minutes uh, from D.C., and we would uh, meet at Paula's house? Uh, yeah, in Georgetown? In Georgetown. I uh, told JFK my about my fantasy. With the Lincoln? Bedroom. Yeah, bedroom, yeah. He said, uh, what? Jack you mentioned Jackie. Oh, okay. Uh, lots. Uh, let's go. Jackie was away on the on a cruise. After about an hour, JFK had to leave for a meeting. Paul but he took her to the Lincoln bedroom. That's what he said. <laughs> Paul, Paul was, was to come for me. I got drunk and was uh, no dressed. I got dressed. Oh, I got dressed, of course, and was redoing redoing my yeah, makeup yeah. when I noticed. Uh, life-size statue i thought of lincoln in the corner uh -huh. he was wearing a uh, black hat a dark yeah. suit and a white shirt paul arrived and and as i was leaving i turned and jokingly said thema your president lincoln for the you thanks to, thank you president lincoln for the years of your bedroom yeah. Yeah. there was nothing <laughs> There, a freeze in my tracks. Paul, oh, I froze. I froze in my tracks. There was nothing there. Oh, you mean the the, the statue was gone? I don't know. Paul, I Paul said head. lots of people have seen him. Uh, there, Larry, Norma, something came oh, from great. the room in her. Panties <laughs> and bra. <laughs> and Who came in? Who came in? In her panties. I think Nora. It says Nora. Yeah. Uh, in her panties and a bra. And a, towel. <clears throat> a towel. And that was his ghost. Oh. As sure as I live, Queen Nora never returned to that room again. And neither you did, did I. I. Maybe. Maybe. Oh, Abe. Abe. Preferred to watch again, and neither did I. Uh, maybe uh, uh, Abe preferred to watch. Uh, well, friend, uh, take care and drop a, a line when you can. As always, your dear friend, Blaze Star. That is weird. Wow. Well, you got to wow. give it. as far as the contest, Blaze is up there. You got to give her a couple. Oh, of course, of course. But we're not. Ooh. She's not in the same category as uh, some of the decent women that we're going to review, right? Well, you right. know, let's well, have to get the, the, the uh, This is the end of the uh, unrespectable women. The, the unrespectable uh, women. Yeah, go ahead. Not, let's not forget right. that JFK was on those steroids and his libido was... Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I remember when Angie, what Angie Dickinson told us that her affair with JFK was the greatest 15 seconds of her life. <laughs> All right, now we go into the respectable yeah, women. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Marita Lorenz. Yeah, what a story that is. Yeah, Marita Lorenz was good looking. Yes, I liked her. Yeah, so what's the story? She was tough. This woman was tough as nails. Yeah, yeah she was Castro's um, lover, and they tried to get the CIA to. Um, the CIA well, they sent Sturgis to. They sent Sturgis to whack her. You know, you know, the story goes that uh, they send her with these poison pills, you know, and she put them in her cold cream uh, yeah. jar, mm -hmm. you know, and when she got to Cuba, it had dissolved. The, the pills, the capsules had dissolved, so <laughs> she couldn't do anything. Well, pretty good idea not to use the cold cream, yes. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. Oh, you're Sylvia. You're Sylvia. Yes. We in custody, this is under highly adverse conditions. She had a certain natural beauty, I agree. Yeah. Right. Now we're going to let our audience 
vote in the comment section. So she, had, she had like this uh, Aztec, you know, uh, Central American uh, indigenous type of uh, features. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's got I agree. Features, no doubt about it. And um, now this is um, is Pamela Tenure. So um, hey, Gary, I hope oh, you, I have I hope do you, you have know. <clears throat> Yeah. You know that uh, Harris, Jones Harris, dated Pamela, who was Jackie's yeah, secretary. That's right, that's right. JFK was tapping Pamela. All right, so right. Hey, Mary, there you go. There's I'm Mary right. Meyer on the right. I'm on it. All right, so you can look at the little worried look there. But um, she was truly beautiful Ooh. in that picture. Mm -hmm. so we yeah, but this, this, this isn't Mary Meyer. That's Mary Myers. Yes, it is. Very young Mary Myers. Very young. Yeah, this was, I got this from um, Peter Jan. Okay. Oh, good, 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 good. All right, so like I said, our um, audience is going to vote for the women, in, the decent women. Well, oh, Sylvia. Sylvia Od Odio. Now, she is a beautiful woman, too. No doubt. Another, let, let, let me just say this. Another woman who was accused of being promiscuous. It seems like you know, in order to break down, you know, uh, destroy their credibility, they have to be, you know, uh, promiscuous. Remember that, that line in JFK uh, when they say, uh, you know, uh, how can a, a woman, if these, she's a prostitute, have by, bad eyesight? You know, so this is sort of like the same situation here. Yeah, really. Like, uh, like Lee Oswald was that good looking that women like this were just going to fall down on their knees. It's just crazy. Mm-hmm. All right, so that's Sylvia Odio, another picture. She's got deep blue eyes. She's a pretty woman, no doubt oh, about she's it. She's beautiful. She was beautiful, and so were her sisters, you know. They were beautiful yeah. women. You know, that's why they went to uh, the trade mart that day to see JFK, and they were in their best uh yeah, they were pouring it on, pouring it on. To see if, they could get, to see if they could get their parents out of Cuba. Judith. <laughs> so we had to be sure we didn't get in trouble, so we had to add Judith there. <laughs> oh, Judith was a was an extremely beautiful woman. I mean, she still is, but you know, at yeah. the time, you know, my God. Of course. All we right. So we uh, joke about that photo on the cover of her book. I know, I know. Yeah. The cocktail dress. All right, Marina. So, yeah, she had beautiful blue eyes, no doubt about it. When she was young. Don't open so, your mouth. She was a good-looking woman. Yeah, no doubt. I know. If you remember, uh, uh, Demoren Shields' manuscript says that she had uh, practically all of her teeth were rotted out. I know we mm. saw that. I remember seeing that before in an uh, interview. Well, today they could give her a nifty set of dentures and she'd look just dandy. Oh yeah, they probably have already. Right. Not Beverly. Beverly. Yeah, you got to give it to her. Now, as far as the women that are still alive, she is hands down. The most beautiful. Is oh, yeah, she's a very elegant. She's a very elegant woman. Right. To this day, she's all woman, 100%. Beverly Olive. Yeah. Oh, Jackie. Nice. Of course, we have to have Miss mm -hmm. Jackie Kennedy. Wonderful right. photos. Good work. Good work. Good work. However, Gary. there's... I mean, there's that's, no that's, a, that's a presidential level wife. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Heck yeah! yeah. Oh yeah! Yeah, she was cultured. She, I mean, you know. sophisticated, intelligent, yeah. charming. Yes, yes. Informed, yes. knowledgeable. Yes. You know, yes. Like yeah. like Kurt Warner. We we used to joke about Kurt Warner's wife Brenda. You know, she was an Arena League football wife, not a NFL level wife. You know. <laughs> Yeah, don't that, that, that's where Kurt. That's where Kurt got recruited out of. You know when he uh, went to the LA Rams, to the St. Louis Rams. No, when he was playing for the Iowa Barnstormers, is where he met Brenda. Mm -hmm. All right, so you know, you'd have to say Jackie Kennedy had it all. However, she didn't have it all. In fact, it's hands down who's the most beautiful woman in all of JFK, and it's not her. It's her. Oh. <laughs> yeah, of course. Of I course. Would, I, she can sing happy birthday to me anytime. Right. Nice. Very nice. Very nice. You yeah. know that dress. You know Very that dress. nice. That she dress. had to be sewn into that dress. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that's look right. at that hand there. What's going on with that hand? <laughs> you mean her left hand? 
Yeah, I wonder what's going on there. Now, Al Franken would have been proud of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a reverse here, you know, sexual harassment, you know, uh, in, in, in reverse. Yeah. Great work, Gary. Great work. Well, you know, you know that uh, Marilyn, Marilyn, uh, after the affair with uh, JFK, you know, and he tried to break it off, you know, she started calling the uh, switchboard in the, at the White House, you know, and, uh, and uh, me, you know, many times. And see, they uh, think that they, that might have been one of the reasons, you know, that, uh, that they knocked her off, you know. No, that was done by Sam Giancana. He sent Johnny Rosselli out to take care of her. She must feel no pain. He was worried she was going to spill the beans at a press conference. Oh, yeah. She got into an emotional state. The, the Kennedys did not take out Marilyn. Mm -hmm. There's a wonderful book by uh, Darwin Porter entitled Marilyn at Rainbow's End. You've got to read this book. Yeah. It gives you insights into Hollywood. They're absolutely spectacular and the demise of Marilyn Monroe. Mm -hmm. All right. Darwin Porter. Um, well done, Gary. Well done. All right. There you go. A lot of fun. But look, before we go into the new year, I'd like to talk about last week's show just for a second. Now, to me, we're just finishing it, Jeff. Fella we're named Lance back in five minutes. humiliated. Who was it? Bill Simpich, uh, Tattenbaum. Uh, who are the other ones, Larry? Help me out. Larry Snaps. Larry Schnapps, this, this boy who's in high school in one hour, you didn't have to have two men bringing up irrelevant crap for two days. You're talking about Lance. You're talking about Lance. I'm talking about Lance. Yeah. Go back and watch the new JFK show number 176. It's called The Next Generation. And watch two teenagers humiliate the entire mock trial and all you had to do was send Lance over there. It would have been over. And you know, <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't have needed to. <laughs> yeah, I, I get it. Yeah, that's, it's, it was impressive, yeah. There you go. All right, any last words for the new year, fellas? Well, it's a real pleasure joining you guys every week to do this. I enjoy it thoroughly. I think we're making a difference. And, uh, I mean, really, uh, this is the cutting edge of JFK research without any yeah, that, doubt. Um, that beauty contest is, has raised the bar in, yeah. in JFK research. <laughs> without a doubt. Yeah, Gary, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think if you missed anybody, you know. I'm trying, you know. Yeah, you know what? I'm sure anybody. Well, you didn't, you didn't have Nellie Conley in there. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone? You didn't have. You didn't have the, the, the mayor's wife. Yeah, I was going to say, I was going to say, yeah, Cavill's wife. Yeah. All right. right. Anyone that we missed out, put it in the comments section. Yeah, right, right. We're going to have another one next New Year's Eve. All right. This okay. is New Jam K Show number 177. It's been a great year, fellas. And uh, with Larry Rivera on the team, we'll roll over him for another year coming. Great work, Larry. Really, really incredible this uh, document that we read tonight. Ha Happy New Year, you guys. And Happy New Year. Dr. Fetzer, we really appreciate your reading skills. You make it seem effortless. <laughs> you know. I just, I just want to say that this document is something that needs to be studied and, and uh, you know, the research on this uh, because it's very significant. Yeah. <clears throat> and it, yeah. it gives you, it gives you a, 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 an insight into what she went through uh, during those days, yeah. we have never ever seen, heard, or heard. And I would say it conclusively destroys the myth that Lee Oswald went to Mexico City to obtain a, a visa to Cuba and the Soviet Union to flee after the assassination. It just puts it into shambles. No, no, no and, and longer it, even remotely credible. And it's like Gary mentioned last week. You know, the this guy impersonating Lee, you know, at the consulate follows that same mo of being at the uh, Bolton Ford of uh, being at the, at the range, at the shooting range, you know, and being, you know, very visible, you know, and very, being very loud and belligerent, you know. So you got it. Happy New Year, you guys. Sensational. Right, right, Great right. pleasure. Good yeah. work, Gary. Okay, JFK 177. We'll see you next year. In Dallas, Texas, three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade. JFK, who, how, and why? Most Americans have never believed Lee Oswald was the lone gunman, and for very good reasons. Here the solution to the greatest murder mystery in history is laid out for the world to see with proof after proof after proof. 
Lee was standing in the doorway when the motorcade passed by, the darkest secret the Warren Commission had to cover up. There were at least six shooters who fired from eight to ten shots or more who, with their handlers and supervisors, are identified here. Photos were faked, the body was changed, x-rays were altered, and the whole movies were fixed. Fifteen experts contribute to a 529-page book with 1,037 photos and diagrams in black and white and color. 